Chairman, Ambassador John Negroponte, who's traveling today, and the INSA staff, thank all of you for being here this evening. A special thanks goes to our many guests from the government who are here with us this evening. Welcome to all of you, and we thank all of you for your service to the country. At tonight's leadership dinner, INSER is honored to, honored to host Lieutenant General Vincent R. Stewart, Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. There you go, there we go. As we know, DIA is a critically important intelligence agency providing intelligence support to all the combatant commands the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States. I know many of us, for many of us, myself included, this is our first opportunity to hear from you, General Stewart. We very much look forward to your presentation and to your discussion with Admiral Jake Jacoby. So thank you for joining us this evening. Let me also express my gratitude to your staff for their enthusiastic support and cooperation in planning this dinner. Briefly, I'd like to recognize the companies whose support made tonight's dinner possible. Oracle, BAE Systems, General Dynamics, Eagle Ray, L3 Communications, Spadero and Associates. These are terrific partners. Thank you for your contributions to this leadership dinner and to all your other events. This means a lot to us. So we thank our sponsors and a round of applause for them. For those of you who have frequently attended leadership dinners in the past, we are going to ask you to do something a little different this evening. If you have a question for General Stewart, please write it down on the cards at your table and hand it to an intern before the conclusion of dinner. You will see them walking around the room. Please give it to them and we'll get it before dinner. This will move the program on, and we can just get into a lot of good discussions between the General and Admiral Jacoby. Following dinner, as I mentioned, retired Vice Admiral Jake Jacoby from INSA's Board of Advisors will lead a discussion with General Stewart. We thank Admiral Jacoby for serving as a moderator this evening and look forward to a terrific conversation between the former and current directors of DIA. So again, please submit your questions to an INSA intern before the dinner concludes, and I thank you for that. Now, a few words about General Stewart before he comes to the podium. He became the 20th director of DIA in January 2015, having previously served as commander of Marine Corps Cyber, Cyber Command. He has the proud distinction of the agency's, being the agency's first director from the Marine Corps. His principal command tours, staff assignments, and deployments have taken him all over the country and around the globe during his 33 years of service. Since 2005, General Stewart has served as Assistant Chief of Staff Intelligence for Marine Corps Forces Command in Norfolk, Virginia, Assistant Chief of Staff Intelligence Second Marine Expeditionary Force at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and Director of Intelligence, Headquarters Marine Corps in Washington. General Stewart's numerous military decorations include, and these are just a few, the Legion of Merit with one gold star, the Meritorious Civil Medal with one gold star, the Defense Superior Service Medal, and the Brown Star. General Stewart graduated with a bachelor's degree in history from Western Illinois University and earned a master's degree from the Naval War College and the National Defense University. Indeed, it's my distinct honor and pleasure welcoming General Stewart to the podium. General Stewart, thank you, sir. Thank you a lot, sir. So, it's a Thursday afternoon, or Thursday evening, and I would have assumed that you all would have had something better to do <laughs> than to hang out here and hear me groan on about the magnificent organization I have the opportunity to lead at the Defense Intelligence Agency. But I am nonetheless glad to be here. 
It's a little daunting, though. You look out there and you see Charlie Allen. And I, he doesn't remember this, but I briefed him once something about open source. And as he used to do back in the days, he, uh, he ripped me a pretty good one. Because <laughs> I didn't have all the answers to his many questions, but I, I survived it. And then you've got uh, former directors of DIA grading my homework here. And uh, the undersec former Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, uh, Steve Cambone, around here somewhere. And uh, really kind of makes me wonder what the heck I got myself into. But I'm going to try a little bit here and talk uh, this evening about uh, not just DIA, but a little bit about how the world has changed during my lifetime and why that is important to what we do at the Defense Intelligence Agency. So if you visited uh, DIA, the first thing you saw as you came through the door was our motto, boldly out front, committed to excellence in the defense of our nation. That motto embodies what DIA is all about, the 16,000 or so men and women around the world committed to the idea that we are responsible for providing realistic, real-time, decision-advantaged intelligence to a wide range of customers. But we also still wrestle with the idea of uh, what should DIA look like, and what should it do, and how should it design itself for the future. And so I talked to the workforce, uh, because none of us want to change. We all are very comfortable. So I talked to the workforce, and I tell them this story. I tell them the story that walks through the course of my career. So I joined uh, the Marine Corps in 1981. There's a, yes, I am old. <laughs> and, uh, and occasionally, I get these really bizarre looks when I talk to some of the younger crowds about joining in 1981. And I tell them the story about joining in 1981, and I walk them through why it's important for the things that DIA will do going forward. And I ask them to look at the world through four lenses. How was DIA organized back in 1981? What was the world like in 1981? Where was technology in 1981? And where were we in this media world in 1981? And then I kind of fast forward them through to where we are today. And I use that as a basis to set up the challenges that we face as an organization and the things that we must do to be successful uh, as an organization. So uh, in 1981, we broke ground at the uh, main facility at DIA. Think about where we were in the world, the operating environment. Soviet Union, evil on one side, United States and the good guys on the other side. Pretty, pretty straightforward way to think about the world. Very kinetic solutions to the problem sets that uh, we faced. We would race through the fold of gap. We'd fight the uh, Russian, the Soviet hordes. If things really got out of, uh, out of hand, we would go nuclear and we would solve all this through very kinetic means. Pretty, pretty simple world. Think about uh, where we were you know, we, we were starting to see, hear things about terrorism. Pan Am 103 got shot down. Um, the bombing in Beirut, uh, at the embassy in Beirut. Um, Egyptian president being assassinated. We're starting to hear things about terrorism in a way that we hadn't experienced before. And think about where we were in technology. IBM launched the first personal computer in the 80s. And we started to hear things about the internet. Remember, remember what mobile phones looked like in the early 80s? <laughs> you all remember that? You know, really small thing, very, uh, oh, wait a minute, that, the big old bricks. <laughs> remember, remember how that personal computer, the IBM Selectric typewriter with the ball, and how we would use the white correcting tape when we made it? <laughs> that was in our lifetime. I mean, we'll talk about where we've come from since then. Um, CD-ROM was invented in 1980s. Think about the media, where we were in the 80s in the media. 
we got uh, Walter Cronkite came on in the evening and told the news. Didn't try to entertain us, told the news. We read newspapers. We got up in the morning, we got one, two, three newspapers, and we read the news. And at the end of the evening, we might get a local news. And that was about it for the news. That was how we got our information, the pace at which we got our information. And then CNN came along in the early 80s. And we rolled into the era of the 24-hour news cycle. And we got the full coverage, 24-hour coverage, of the Berlin Wall coming down in Germany in 1989. DIA was about 4,000 strong. And DIA, at the time, uh, the director was General Williams. And we were still, at that point, trying to figure out how do we support the operational commander and balance that against our requirements to support national decision makers. And we're starting to embrace the concept of intelligence as a force multiplier. But we weren't quite sure where we fit in uh, the grand scheme. Now think about, let, let's, sometimes when I tell this uh, story, I kind of walk them through the 90s and two, but let's just fast forward to where we are today. Very different world. Think about the operating environment we face today. Think about the challenges we face just in the Middle East, where we now have the fault lines in a country like Iraq that may be irreparably fractured and may not come back as an intact state that we all grew up. Iraq may never go back into an intact state. Think about the idea of a Kurdistan, a Shia stan, a Sunni stan. And what happens if this this Kurdistan, and I, we wrote these remarks here a couple weeks ago. What happens if this Kurdistan gets into a fight with uh, a NATO partner? And that NATO partner says, hey, uh, this Article 5 thing means something, so we need you to come and help us. We've been attacked. And if you walked away from uh, Iraq and you went uh, to the west, you'd see a lot of fracture in, in Syria where you could end up with an Alawite stand in the middle and something to the north and something to the south. And you see nation states collapsing in the region and maybe going to ethnic lines. And none of us understands where that will lead five minutes from now or five years from now. And I haven't talked about Asia and I haven't talked about contested and disputed territories in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. And I haven't talked about the crazy in North Korea. And I haven't talked about the resurgence of Russia. Remember when Russia was going to be our friends? <laughs> it seems like a long time ago. They were going to be our partners. They were going to help us solve some of the hard challenges in the world. And now they're talking about the importance of their near abroad and the importance of being treated as a, a, a viable, strong nation state that has a role to play on. The, and let me tell you, they're playing their role on the global stage and everywhere that we have an interest. And so the world's changed and no longer kinetic. We've now laid on top of this kinetic, this uh, fractured world a kinetic problem set, a terrorist problem set, and a cyberspace that we have to work our way through. So the operating environment is a little bit different than in 1981. Think about uh, the media. Very different world. Who doesn't have a smartphone in, in the room? I guarantee there probably isn't, uh, unless you're on the wait staff. Everyone here, and there are probably a couple on the wait staff that has theirs. Every one of us has a smartphone. Ten years or so ago, if a Tunisian had set himself on fire in Tunisia, it would have been an interesting local story. With the advent of smartphones and Facebook and social media, 
Someone captures that image. In milliseconds, it's global and kicks off a revolution. And that's the space that our intelligence community faces, uh, uh, deals with today. A complex world, a world where information is moving so quickly and so dynamically. We used to worry about uh, the, the difference between tactical and strategic. This tactical and strategic landscape has collapsed where we have no idea where tactical, operational, so are we organized as an agency? Are we organized as a community to deal with that collapse in that? Uh, and we're now collapsing in space and time. You know, we used to talk about current intel and future intel. We could do forecasting five years from now. When I talk to people about uh, forecast for 2020, they're talking about 2020 tonight. <laughs> because the world is changing so much and information is moving so quickly. And the variables that we used to be able to look at and measure so discreetly are changing and the technology and the advanced weapons and advanced weaponry is available anywhere that you have money to buy advanced weapons. And the speed at which information is traveling and the volume of the information that's traveling and the velocity and the intelligence community must stay ahead of that in that very fractured and complex world. So uh, about three weeks ago, uh, the Houthis launched a Scud missile towards the Saudi Arabia. First warning of that event, hashtag Scud launch. Someone tweeted, that a scud had been launched. And that's how we started to search for this activity. This is the environment that the intelligence community now faces. So DI is much bigger today, and you know we're 16,000 or so folks, and we're doing an awful lot of different things in different locations. And we started back in 1961 with about 18 or so mission areas. And we're over 87 missionaries today. And sometimes it's awfully hard to figure out what is core and what is essential and where we must invest and what's just stuff that somebody's got to do and guess what, nobody else wants to do it, so over to DIA. And so we're trying to think our way through how we organize for this different world. So uh, my predecessor, uh, Mike Flynn, back in uh, May of 2013, organized DIA in uh, these integrated intel centers, aligned regionally with the idea that you could give one individual the control of everything within that region. So no longer negotiating with the collection manager, no longer negotiating with the ops guy, no longer he owned the totality of the intel cycle. It was such a brilliant idea, brilliant in its simplicity, that the CIA stole that idea. <laughs> That's when I knew it was a good idea. <laughs> when, when John Brennan rolled out his centers and everybody said, holy cow, look at what John Brennan is doing. This is so innovative. And we kind of started that a couple of years ago. Now, having said that, it was, it was a little bit ahead of its time. So uh, folks weren't quite ready for that. So we spent a couple of years litigating what the hell that meant, and so we're, we're coming out of that process now. But the idea is you put one person in charge of the totality of the intelligence cycle in support of a regional commander, and he owns it, he runs it, he negotiates only with himself, and maybe me. And so we're going to do the, we're going to go full bore into our intelligence uh, integrated intel centers, and we've now asked our uh, Pacific uh, Center to lead this effort, have us think our way through what it really means to be fully integrated. So that's the operating model for DIA, so that we can deal with the compression of time and the totality of support we have to do for our operational commanders. 
And if we sorted out and we got through the operating model and we didn't change the way we move information, then we would have missed also. So you all, you all have heard about EyeSight, and we are absolutely 100% committed to EyeSight, the IC integrated uh, uh, IT environment. A cloud-based environment that will allow us to move and shift information across multiple domains so that we can share and we can collaborate. And oh, by the way, maybe, maybe put the rules and tools that our young analysts and our young operators are so comfortable with, with their, in this, in this insane, think about this. I, I'm a Marine, you all know that, right? And I walk into DIA and we have more antiquated equipment than I'm used to in the Marine Corps. <laughs> that's, a, that's a scary damn thought because we have, we have cans and strings still. And oca occasionally we use smoke. And I walk into the facility and we got equipment that's 10 years old. And I walk out of the building, I get my smartphone and my iPad and I got an app for every damn thing. And I'm in a system that we designed back in the 60s. We didn't design it with security in mind. We didn't design it with collaboration in mind. We didn't design it to move information at the speed at which we need to make decisions today. So we're going to fix that. 100% fully committed to using EyeSight. So in committed to it, I'm going to take one of my seniors. Some of you know Kathy Johnston. Kathy Johnston, uh, formerly my uh, director of analysis. Y'all know she's not, right? That's not a surprise to anybody that she's no longer director of analysis. Anyway, Kathy's gonna uh, come off out of battery and she's gonna focus on how we operationalize EyeSight. So that it's not just a really cool high-speed architecture, that we actually have the rules, the tools, the procedures, the different way that we will operate in this environment. And she's going to figure that out, and she's going to keep doing that until she gets it right, or uh, eight years from now when I move on. <laughs> so we're going to put the tools in place so our folks can have uh, those things that will make the move uh, uh, information to support decision makers across the enterprise. And then the third area we're really going to focus on is uh, this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, <laughs> really. but. It's remarkable how little attention we pay to the key to success in all of this. We're going to focus on people. We're going to go find the very best people. We're going to train them. We're going to put in place a career path for them. We're going to put skills. Uh, we're, we're going to certify people to do their jobs. Isn't that amazing? Think about this. We certify forklift operators. We certify forklift operators, and we are scared to certify analysts based on some standards that we expect all of our analysts to, to comply with. Isn't that amazing? We're afraid to certify folks. So we're going to find people. We're probably going to have to get rid of some people, too. I don't think everybody, you know, the ones who aren't that good, it's okay if they go to another agency. I'm, I'm good with that. I, I love all the other agencies. I'm not competing with anybody. I, I love you all. All the folks who grew up in the CIA. I mean, it's, it's, it's good. I mean, think about this. If you wanted to be the best in the military, you'd join the Marine Corps. So, all right, I'm only kidding. I mean, it's... If, you're right. I mean, but if, but if you couldn't, it's okay to join the Army. I mean, I'm not, I won't hold that against anybody. So, so, so if you want to be the best, I want you to be part of DIA. And if you, if you can't make the cut, it's okay. Love you, brother. I'll help you get a job someplace else. So we're going to focus on um, converting from rank and position, where we've emphasized the importance of the position to a rank and person, where we'll emphasize the importance of developing the people. 
It's that simple. Career guides, promotion guides, promotion opportunities that is transparent to every, so it's not the guys and gals in the back room kind of figuring out who they like and someone gets a position. That is, is a completely transparent. And I'm about to hire the greatest HR director to implement this over the next three years. And uh, we're absolutely 100% committed to taking care of this magnificent workforce that we have today. So, um, very complex world, uh, very dangerous world, very chaotic world, worst environment that I've seen in my 34 years of uh, doing this business. It's not the worst ever probably because I suspect back in 1815, go back 200 years, I'm sure those guys in 1815 probably were thinking this is a pretty horrible world. You know, we just get a war of 1812. Anybody know any, anything about war of 1812? You know, we, we just fought the Brits. Before we fought the Brits, we were wondering if we are going to fight the Brits and the French. We are eyeballing Canada. You know, we were just kind of getting our, our, our feet under us uh, coming out of the revolution, and we are eyeballing Canada. And we got conflict with uh, Native Americans all over uh, the region, and Mexico and Spani Spaniards are licking their chops waiting for us to fall apart. Working into that decade, you had... Uh, a former Vice President Aaron Burr wanted to carve out Louisiana and parts of Texas for his own state. The little Corsican was running around in Europe. <laughs> I bet back then they thought it was a pretty wild and chaotic time. What's the difference? The pace at which information moves, the advanced weaponry that's available uh, today, and the fact that decisions are made and incidents occur around the world at the speed of the network. And if you don't have a reliable, resilient network with really talented individuals with the right tools to see the information, understand it faster than anybody, deliver decision, uh, valuable content to decision makers, you're lost. You're lost. And it could be over that quickly. So I need help. I need help, not because I don't have great folks. We've got an incredible workforce. Even the ones that uh, should go away, still pretty good. <laughs> we got an incredible workforce. We have a great, great leadership team. Great leadership team. But I still need help. I need help in how we educate this workforce differently because I got to educate a workforce that's global. And I can't educate that workforce by doing 100 students uh, annually. I've got to educate them. I have to have the best distance education program in the world. I mean, think about this. We are get, we're able to get master's degree from some of the most prestigious universities in the world. And yet, I have an education system that is just chunking away on, I better not name a technology because one of you all might own that. <laughs> but we've got to improve the education, uh, the distance education uh, system that we have. And I have to get uh, tools that will help us sift through this huge amount of data so that we can get to that needle in the stack of the needle and deliver information and intelligence in a timely manner. And I've got to have an architecture that will allow me to share and co collaborate with everyone. Did I mention our partners? Because someone said I've got to do this thing called global coverage. I'm not sure what the hell that means. I just know I can't do it by myself. So I've got to have an enterprise that will allow me to share and collaborate with key partners. How about we start with our Commonwealth partners? How about if we figure out how to leverage, and they don't mind if I say leverage, our Five Eyes partners, to help us understand the world. So one of the things we're going to do here, uh, probably by October, I'm bringing a Five Eyes flag officer onto the command deck at DIA for, uh, for integration with our Commonwealth partners. And if I, if I stay the full 15 years that I'd like to stay at DIA, 
I will turn DIA into a Five Eyes agency with a no foreign enclave rather than what we have today, a no foreign agency with a Five Eyes enclave. And I'd go find the other partners who want to share with us and collaborate with us and help us to understand the world. So we've got to do that. We've got to leverage our partners. And I need help getting through all that data. And I need help to move information quickly. And I need to be able to do it securely. Because uh, I don't know if you've heard, but there are a bunch of guys who are trying to get inside our network and steal the data that we have in the network. And we've got to do networks a little bit different than we've done in the past. Because uh, some folks don't like when I say this, but we've built Maginot Lines. Anybody remember when the French built the Maginot Line? Big bunkers. That's what, uh, that's what our signatures and, and firewalls are. Maginot Lines are bunkers that we think are protecting our networks and someone will maneuver around the networks to get what's inside the network, the data. And I don't hear anybody talking about data strategy that encrypts and secure data and makes it available where it's tagged and used by anyone based on their, uh, their uh, clearances. We gotta work on the data. So all those things, if you can help us with, we'll be glad to take your help. If uh, you're not willing to help, uh, I've got a couple agencies I'd like to send you. You can, <laughs> you can slow them down. Send your good thoughts and prayers for the great folks that we have working. They have a tough mission. They're doing fantastic work. And uh, we're going to push them a little bit over the next several uh, months until we get this thing right. I've been blessed to have uh, followed in the footsteps of some great uh, directors who set, up, set us up on the right path but we're in a very different place today. And we've got a reposture with the right model, with the right architecture, and the right people, and I think we're on our way. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for entertaining me, and uh, look forward to questions. Okay. So we're going to do dinner, uh, but uh, before we do dinner, I want to uh, share another little insight. How many are wearing Fitbits tonight? Okay. So, 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 General Stewart, are you wearing your Fitbit tonight? Okay. So, in in terms of uh, trying to be relevant to a workforce. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that uh, General Stewart did was uh, to declare at DIA that Fitbits could come inside a skiff. <laughs> so I've got 19,282 right now. How many you got? <laughs> After dinner discussion, uh, we've already met General Stewart. And uh, I'm going to ask again, the, uh, I think I'm up to 20,822. <laughs> uh, we've met General Stewart. Uh, I think all of you know uh, that uh, we have a former dep uh, director of DIA uh, to moderate some questions up here. Uh, but I just wanted to briefly uh, mention uh, Jake Jacoby a member of the ENSA Board of Directors, uh, a former director of DIA, a retired vice admiral, uh, a neighbor in the Northern Neck, and a good friend, uh, but a great friend of the intelligence community. So welcome, Jake Jacoby, and over to you, Jake. Now, I'm starting off at a distinct disadvantage. Uh, I think one of the things that Marines do is uh, uh, take the offense just as early as possible, okay, and and I think uh, I think General Stewart's already done that because because I was the director ten years ago that gave him the IT structure that he has today, <laughs> and and clearly I wasn't good enough to be a Marine, and I doubt I could get a job at DIA as a civilian today. So so I'm at a, I'm starting at a, a disadvantage, but I do have one advantage, and that is I've got the stack of your questions. So we're going to do the. Uh, uh, 
too general, uh, we, we can't call it speed dating. Yep. There we go. There Thanks. we go. We can't do speed dating because you're a Marine, so I guess we just do speed questioning if, uh, if that works. Uh, I've got a pretty good stack here, and I tried to put them in, in you know, by, by topics or general topics. And the first set are sort of that, uh, that substance, uh, current intel kind of a thing. Uh, first question is, how do you, how do you change a, uh, uh, a situation where for 15 years the principal uh, focus has been on find, fix, finish, tactical, find the bad guy, finish the bad guy, to the world that you're talking about, which has a major piece in there about strategic warning, uh, assessments, analysis, and uh, impositioning of uh, capabilities uh, uh, for, uh, for future needs. Yeah, that, that's a really hard question, and I'm not answering it. <laughs> I'll keep poking at it. <laughs> Uh, actually, that's a great question. You know, we're, we're wrestling now. Uh, I get it. Ter Counterterrorism is incredibly important. But at the heart of what DIA does is the foundational intelligence that helps us to deter conflict and win decisively. So we're moving folks back into uh, S&T uh, intelligence. Uh, we're reinvesting in uh, S&T intelligence. We're reinvesting in uh, how we support acquisition. We're reinvesting in Actually, I shouldn't say reinvesting. We're, we're trying to change how intelligence drives the acquisition process. Anybody know the star reports, or star uh, uh, products? The big, cumbersome uh, uh, telephone book things that nobody ever read, but we satisfied the requirement because we gave an intelligence assessment up front. We're looking now at a more dynamic model where we'll inject intelligence throughout the entire uh, uh, process. Um, and I say all that. Uh, as aspirational, yeah. uh, because the minute I say I'm not going to do CT or Mazint or some other thing, uh, I get an awful lot of attention from everyone who has a, um, a vote either on the Hill or a, uh, uh, some stake in the game. But we're going to move in that direction. Uh, it will take us a little while. Um, but we're starting to realign folks to do some of those foundational intelligence uh, uh, work that we stopped doing for the last 15 years. How about if we took it a step further? Yeah. Uh, one of your roles is, is the, uh, the program manager for the General Defense Intelligence Program, mm -hmm. which means that you've got funding responsibilities yeah. for the service intel centers mm -hmm. for MISIC and, and so forth. They play a part in here. How, does, how do you bring that all together? Yeah, we just had a very lively discussion this afternoon where uh, I rolled over and let them do exactly what they wanted to do. Admiral Train, <laughs> it's yeah. a wonderful news, ma'am. You know, yeah, so I was telling uh, General Groen, uh, because the Marine Corps portion of the GDIP is really, really large. Now it's, it is. It's <laughs> it, was, it was tiny when I was doing it. Yeah, it still yeah. is. <laughs> and unfortunately, I recounted uh, what, what someone told me many years ago is, if I took all of the Marine Corps' money, it really wouldn't make a significant difference. So Mike is going to get more money so that it will make a difference next year. <laughs> but we, we, we spent, seriously though, we spent uh, two or three hours this afternoon, uh, Mike, uh, just kind of going through some of the hard calls that we've got to make now. Uh, we've gone through all the easy choices. Yeah. There's no longer uh, the discussion about cutting into muscle. or We're now taking limbs. We're going to have to do pro kill programs, stop doing things, at least we're going to try, because we just can't afford it. The, uh, the requirements are off the charts uh, and not getting any easier, and the funding levels are going in the opposite direction. And so uh, we're making some tough calls now. We're going to go forward to DNI with a budget proposal that I know I'm going to get my butt whipped because we, we put some tough cuts in there. As you look at the cuts and the, and the requirements, are there key places where yeah. industry is going to play a, you know, a, a role or needs to play a, you know, an, an increasing role for you? Yeah. Um, I, I'll tell you one area that I, we've got to get much better at that the industry can help us with. It's in modeling, sim, uh, modeling and simulation. Not just modeling and simulation for uh, advanced weapon systems, but modeling and simulation in a way that delivers content dynamically to our users, interactively to our users, 
or the user can look at different variables and think about the decisions as they see. The days when we can produce hard copy, bind it, send it, I mean, it, it, it's, it's obsolete by the time it's delivered to the user. So I need significant amount of help in doing modeling in SIM, not just for the SMT world, not just for the acquisition world, but for how we might deliver content in the future. If you, anybody's got any help uh, on that one, we'll, we'll, we'll like to talk. How about another part of, the, of this uh, the world you talked about of, uh, of chaos and also speed, uh, social media. Yeah. Um, uh, what's your concept for being able to ingest, digest, uh, digest insert, and, yeah. then, and then distribute uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the take from uh, social media? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant. Uh, social media is a lucrative environment. Uh, we're doing some things in social media that is very, um, has helped us to understand how our adversaries are used. I mean, think about this. Uh, all of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines have uh, smartphones, and they're sending things home, uh, reporting on Facebook, they're tweeting. Uh, just think how powerful it would be to be able to capture all of that and digest that and produce something that shows how folks are moving. I, I think there's some opportunities there. And uh, unfortunately, some, yeah, there's some opportunities. I'll stop there. Because even though it's open source and it's publicly available, there's, there's uh, I think maybe we might not want to talk too much about right. some of the ways we're exploiting that. Not that any of you all would tell uh, our secrets, but. How about, how about this world of, uh, of protecting secrets, counterintelligence? Yeah. Uh, you didn't talk yeah. about it earlier. Uh, uh, what about the way ahead yeah. for DIA in, the, in, yeah. in, in that environment? So um, when, I, when I took over at Marfor Cyber, I made the assumption that our networks were penetrated, that our adversaries had penetrated all of our networks. And if that's the case, then we ought to go figure out how we find them and defeat, drive them out of our networks, defeat them in our networks. I've taken that same assumption going into DIA. That if we're an organization that's worth a damn, our adversaries are probably interested in what they do, uh, what we're doing, and so we're probably penetrated. And so I've asked my Office of Counterintelligence to take a good hard look at everybody in the enterprise. And uh, they've actually put some interesting techniques out there that, has uh, surfaced uh, some, some things that concern us. So we're investing in counterintelligence because if you're a first-rate intelligence organization, your adversary's probably trying to get inside. And so we're gonna go find them and see if we can drive them out of our enterprise. Is most of that gonna be done uh, uh, as an inherently governmental function or is yes. there uh, in industry need? Yeah, I, I don't know that I can uh, get a whole lot of help from industry on this one. What about language? Uh, questions yeah. here about uh, your requirements for linguists yeah. and, uh, and, and that, that part of the, uh, of the assessment We never process. get the linguist thing right. Uh, the hope is that we don't get it completely wrong. And I'm the worst person to talk about what are the language requirements for the future. I had a great analyst uh, back in 1990 said, hey sir, I've been offered the opportunity to go to Somali language school. And I said, what the hell are you gonna do? No one's gonna need Somali language, I said, what the hell? So I don't know, I'll, I'll get that uh, wrong most of the time, but we can't keep up with uh, uh, the demand for the wide range of languages that we need. So we need automated language translation uh, capabilities. And I think that's an area that the industry can help us a great deal with. There's, there's lots of work there. I will never grow enough of the right linguists for the crisis that will pop up next week. How we can automate the language translation will be hugely valuable. Switch gears, yeah. cyber. Yeah. Um, uh, you talked about uh, today's operating environment. Uh, uh, can you explain to us what role DIA plays uh, as an all-source intel yeah. agency in defeating that uh, cyber threat and providing warning? Yeah. So uh, again, going back to foundational intelligence. Uh, whether I understand an adversary C4 ISR uh, network to do a kinetic strike or to do a more discrete, non-kinetic strike, I've got to have all that foundational intelligence. And so uh, the easy part is there's a, uh, a, a telecommunication box or a building, do the targeting, drop a 500-pounder, destroy it. That's <laughs> easy. 
That still requires a significant amount of foundational data to do that. Now the complicated part comes in when you got to go find the right router, the right switch, the right software. That's, a, that's an exquisite amount of intelligence that we have, quite frankly, not invested a significant amount in. So I, I was over uh, visiting Admiral Train yesterday, and her folks at O&I are doing some fantastic thing and things in that foundational uh, world. So we're going to steal the ideas, uh, build on it, and we're going to scale that to about four target areas and refine how we do the foundational intelligence in support of kinetics targeting, non-kinetic soft uh, kills. So we're going to spend a little bit of time. I don't have a whole lot of money to do that or resources to do that. Uh, so as we refine the models, uh, that's probably the area I, I can get some help from industry in thinking how we take that model, refine it, and be able to deploy it across the broader enterprise. What's the IA's uh, responsibility as a relationship with Cybercom? Uh, we're, we're, we're like this. <laughs> uh, that's, that's... I'm not asking for how it's no, going, no, and yeah. sort of what no, the no. responsibilities and requirements are. Yeah, I, I, st <laughs> I still think, I come back to the last uh, answer. We, we're still responsible for the all-source foundational intelligence that supports the uh, cyber uh, operations. I, I don't think everybody accepts that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've got uh, commitment to invest in that. But at, at, at the heart of it, it's still basic, foundational. It's just more exquisite if you want to go after the discrete areas in the cyber domain. And we ought to be building that and having that available uh, for uh, the targeting uh, set for, uh, for Cybercom. We're working through that now. Uh, the challenge we have is that there's been a significant investment in building out our cyber mission force. Mm -hmm. And so we're building this capability, but we haven't put a whole lot invested in how you get that foundational data. So we're, we're, we're cheating a little bit, and we're moving some folks around so we can get that. And like I said, we're going to build on what Liz Train and our folks at uh, ON and I are doing, and we'll be ready to support Cybercom when they, uh, when they need us. How does this fit into your center concept? In other words, where, yeah. where would this work center yeah. or, or, or be focused within the agency? Yeah, I think, I think part of what we're stepping our way through now is how much of that foundational data is going to be done day to day in the centers because some of that is is long term uh, that should be on the shelf should be in the uh, uh, database but there's going to be a component of uh, DIA that is not in the center that will focus on some of those long term analytic efforts long term being 2045 uh, today or something like that so I don't think they're going to be yet embedded within the center Mm -hmm. I think I'll hold some of that out within uh, the Directorate of Analysis and then be able to deliver that as we do, uh, build the model. Right. Shift gears. Lots been said recently, in fact, I'd, I'd say a surprising amount about space, space vulnerabilities, yeah. counter space. Yeah. Uh, uh, what role does the IA play in, in this world uh, in the threat assessment yeah. and associated uh, activities? So all of our adversaries have watched how we've gone to war over the last uh, 25 or so years. They know our significant reliance on overhead architecture. They know our significant reliance on ISR. Uh, they know our significant uh, reliance on precision fires, precision maneuver, all the things that are in this digital domain, many of which are in uh, the overhead architecture. So I, would, I think our adversary would be really foolish if they weren't thinking their way through how do you deny us space, how do you deny us the overhead, how do you deny us the precision. So we're, um, no one wants to talk about warfare in space, but we certainly are looking at ways that we can understand activities in space, characterize activities in space, and deliver those models so that whichever organization gets the mission of protecting our space assets or delivering resilient space capability will have uh, the situation awareness. And so now we're, we're thinking our way through how we build uh, the things that will let us deal with space and counter space initiatives. For those in the audience who would want to interact with DIA, will this yeah. be something that's done again in, in a center, or will this be uh, a lot like cyber? Uh, you yeah, know, cyber I, I think a good portion of this will be done in our S&T uh, section. Okay. And 
We just hired a great uh, young man to run our S&T section. Some of you may know him, Artie Lyons. And Artie Lyons just took over that, uh, that effort from uh, Melissa Drisco. And so go see Artie Lyons, because I've tasked him to help us to understand space. Uh, so between Artie Lyons and Sean Kirkpatrick, my SIO for space, those are my two key uh, uh, belly buttons for space ops. Shift gears on you a little bit. You keep shifting gears. I'm going to keep shifting keep all the way through the stack. You know, this is almost as bad as testifying on the Hill. <laughs> now, now, I was told the other day by the general staff that he was going to spend this morning on the Hill, yeah. and we were going to catch him on the rebound. Mm -hmm. Well, he got out of that this morning, so I figured it's my turn. Yeah, yeah. You're lucky I didn't go on the Hill, because I had been in a really bad mood tonight. <laughs> well, you, your comments would have been a little different at the podium, I think. Yeah, yeah. Defense human service. Do you know who my favorite person on the Hill is? I, so, some of you probably met know. him. Anybody you met, uh, Senator John McCain? Yeah. That's, that's like my favorite guy on the Hill. I love the guy. Am I being compared? <laughs> <laughs> Defense human service. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's the? Uh, uh, what I got to say, I love John McCain. You know why? Because some of you are going to report that I said I love John McCain and he's going to beat the hell out of me next time I testify. <laughs> Defense these, human. These are your closest friends, 350 yeah, of us, and not uh, one of us has loose lips. So we're, yeah, I know. We're, we're, Defense human. The, the way ahead, uh, yeah, how's yeah. that looking? You know, we started off uh, back, uh, I think, 2009 time frame uh, to, to revitalize, I guess is probably the best way I can call it, uh, revitalize our human, uh, defense human. Uh, we called it the defense clandestine service. It got a lot of friction yeah. because folks believed it was duplicative to what uh, NCS did. But the reality is um, I can't get NCS to focus on the things that are important to the defense intelligence community. I can't get them to focus on weapons system, weapons technology, military capability, which is the sweet spot of what I need to do to support our operational commander. So I needed, we needed, uh, our own focused defense human effort to go after those target sets. We got that. We started off with a fairly high number, about uh, 1,000 I think we wanted to, to build, and we got some help from our folks on the Hill who said, uh, let's start with about 500. Uh, that force is growing. They're going through the training. Uh, they are in the field. They're out of uh, the states. They're forward deployed. They are going after the hard targets. They're reporting effectively, and they are doing it right alongside their NCS partners. There is no competition because there's plenty of work to go around. Uh, they're getting very credible reporting, and they're getting great, great insights. I think we're in a good place. The Hill. We still have to go up and massage the folks mm -hmm. on the Hill periodically. Um, but I think we're in a really good place with our defense uh, clandestine service. We'll stabilize the number, probably something less than 500, uh, because of the, all of the other support things that goes into supporting a DCS effort. Um, but I think we're in a really good place at this point. The, uh, uh, the agency uses uh, uh, civilian contractors and some of those supporting yeah. roles and so forth. Does your uh, concept call for that also? Yeah. Uh, I, don't know, I, I don't know any way that I'm going to be able to do all the things we want to do without uh, a fairly robust uh, contractor support. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how I'm going to afford uh, a much more robust contractor uh, cadre. I know, I know we need them, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't, I don't foresee a whole lot of growth in that space. There are a couple places where we'll, uh, we'll, we'll probably leverage contractors as we ramp up uh, so as we have a resurgent Russia. There are probably some old Russia hands out there that we'd like to hire until we can grow that next generation of expertise. I see you, uh, uh, Suzanne, Sharon. Uh, so uh, Russia hands, uh, you, there might be a job out there for you. Um, uh, some of the S&T uh, Intel. Mm -hmm. Uh, and acquisition specialists. We're probably going to have to contract some of those until we grow that workforce. So not a great deal of growth because we're getting a lot of attention from folks on the Hill about uh, the contractor workforce. But there is some, uh, there is some room for hiring. This, this is about 
quality and special specific yep. skills rather than quantity. Absolutely, right? yep. absolutely. Mazent, now if, if I was a little meaner than I am, I'd ask you to tell me what Mazent is, but yeah. let's, let's not, let's not yeah. try that, because I never could explain yeah. it to. I, I couldn't explain it either, but. How about, uh, how about uh, where are areas of potential investment and emphasis and focus uh, uh, in that area with you being the functional manager for that, uh, that discipline? Yeah. Uh, one of the things we're really looking at is uh, we've got some Mazent platforms that cost an awful lot uh, that we're not getting the return on our investments. Hmm. And so those are some areas that we're going to look really hard at and try to convince folks that uh, it is as important to get return on our investment as it is to keep a platform or capability alive. So uh, we're going to be pretty discreet about uh, some of our Mazent investment. I'm going to stop right there before you all start guessing which platform uh, we might try to cut. Okay. Well, we just we, we we can't do we can't cover every aspect with single unique platforms in this fiscal environment. I'll, I'll stop there. I see. Some of you all have uh, Mazent in your portfolio, so don't pa don't panic. It won't all go away. And the, just a big chunk of it. <laughs> <laughs> is, and is the uh, point of contact again back into the S and T director yeah. for, for most of that work? Yeah. Eyesight. Yeah. You talked about it in your your comments. Uh, uh, do you have a couple of really high priority requirements in terms of eyesight mm -hmm. implementation uh, in mind? Yeah. Um, I, get, I guess probably the, the, uh, the highest priority, and this is why I've asked Kathy uh, Johnson to take a look at this. Uh, we're going to build this architecture, and we have no idea how we're going to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've got to figure out the right governance and the right rules uh, of operating. How do we develop the right apps to work in this environment? So we're going to need some help in developing the right apps that cross multiple domains, cross uh, multiple functions. Uh, we're gonna, uh, probably the hardest part for us will be um, cleaning up the multitude of apps that are out there, the niche boutique things that I'm the only person who uses this and I love it and don't anybody touch my app. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're gonna have to work on uh, maintenance of apps that we put in this space. But if we design this architecture and we just continue to do business as usual, it will be an absolute waste of money. It's like designing the Audubon and putting horse and buggy on the Audubon. So we've got to figure out what are the right rules, what are the right tools, what are the right governance procedures uh, to make this as effective and efficient as possible. And if we don't do that, we'll have tinkled away the taxpayers' money because it ain't going to be cheap to de deploy eyesight. Some have said that the... Uh uh, the issues uh, revolve as much around culture and, yeah. and, uh, and, and the people part as it does about the architecture yeah. part. Is, that, is, is part of Kathy's uh, portfolio to work on the, uh, uh, on the, you know, the persuading and the, and the cultural aspects? Yeah. I don't know if she's going to have to work on a persuading. I'm just going to tell folks to do it. Or, or I, I forgot. Yeah, I forgot the Marines in charge. You know, and, and, no, you're there for, and you're there for 15 uh, years, uh, so you're going to wait know, them out. Huh? I'm gonna, uh, it's a minimum of eight years. <laughs> and, uh, I heard mention of 15, but well, I don't know yeah, where that came up. 15 is my stretch goal, but <laughs> um, I figure that um, the last two or three directors were Army, right? right? They, they all wanted to be Marines. Yeah, no, no, no. And they, they're, they're great Army officers. I got nothing against. But they stayed for about eight years. So given the fact that I'm the first Marine, hmm. And the last two or so done eight, I figure I need to do at least eight to kind of balance out the modern average, <laughs> right? And now if we look across the totality of the directors, if I get 15 years, it'll average out all of them. You'll catch up with the Navy then. Yeah, I'll catch yeah. up with the Navy. So I think that's, uh, but I, I, you know, yeah, a good part of this is culture. Yep. A good part of this is culture and uh, and some of the workforce will get this almost instantly. In fact, they're craving it. Mm -hmm. They're begging for different ways to do business. And then some of us uh, more mature members of the community are going, holy cow, I don't, 
where's my pager? I don't want to do this stuff. <laughs> I don't want to jump into 2015. So we'll have to work, not all of us. Um, mm. General Grohn has a pager. I, I don't hold that against him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the portable phone that's this big. <laughs> I, think, I think the young people will get this. I think the young people are, are dying for it. I think some of our, our more mature folks also understand it. Uh, um, but that will be the harder part, because folks are very comfortable with the standard production approach, the standard delivery of content, the standard delivery of thinking about how we do analysis, and all of that, all of that must change in this, in this environment. People, yeah. the people part. Uh, uh, what training requirements do you have, and what role will contracts like, contractors likely play mm -hmm. Uh, in your effort to develop the right people. Yeah, I, I, may, I may actually see some more investment in contractors because that's a, a skill that I may not want to grow. And I talked a little bit about this uh, already. I've got uh, folks in 140 different countries. Uh, I've got folks uh, deployed globally. I can't bring them all back to the NCR for training. I can't no longer afford sending uh, mobile training teams forward. So I've got to connect them to the enterprise. And I've got to be able to share all of the things that we're learning here, all the things that we have access to at George Washington and George Mason and all the great universities. I've got to be able to connect them to that. So how we help our folks uh, learn uh, through distributed learning environment, through an immersive training environment, uh, through an environment that is successively challenging to them not your static, go read a book and take a test. I think those are areas where industry can really help us with it. I got at least one card from someone who says he has the answer, and I won't call him out by name, but I'm certainly going to call him next week. And this is, the point of contact is back into your, your training center people? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so right now, right now I'm in the process of train, uh, ch uh, changing out uh, our training uh, folks. Uh, not because they're not great people, uh, but because I want some new ideas. Okay. Uh, you talked about changes in your civilian workforce. Yeah. I understand they're all going to NGA, as best I could tell from your comments. Yeah. That, what, what plans? I got to tell you something. Uh, this is honest truth, and NSA hates when I say this, but my closest partner today is NGA. Hmm. We are aligned philosophically. Uh, we're aligned in the things that we're talking about in support of our operational commanders. And this doesn't mean that NSA isn't, but philosophically, uh, we're, we are as close as, uh, as thieves. And plus, they're your eyesight yeah. partner and key your eyesight responsibilities, partner, too, right? Uh, absolutely. So yeah. we walk pretty closely. There's Mary over there. Uh, it's, it's kind of a cool thing to send out uh, DIA, NGA weekly updates. And so we've been trying to shame some other folks to join us and have other people join us. So I, I, I think that's as strong a partnership as we have right now. You talked about changes in your civilian workforce yeah. and refocusing and so forth. Do you have any specific things with respect to the contractor workforce that uh, fall into the Why same category? Why do you keep category? asking about contractors? <laughs> they're, they're, they're paying the bill. I are um, one, you know, those kinds well, of things. Uh, uh, no. Nothing specific. Yeah. Hey, hey, look, if you're a good contractor, I can find a place for you. Just like everybody else uh, uh, who wants to join the DIA team, if you got your stuff in one, uh, in one sock and you've got a skill set that I need and you're willing to roll your sleeves up and go to work, we can find a place for you. Leads right into the next question. If you just want to hang out. Somewhere else. Huh? Somewhere else. What concerns do you have with respect to attracting and retaining the talent you need? Um, so I, I go back to this divide that I have. I've got a young workforce who's really ready to move and get new ideas and change the way we, and then I've got another workforce that is very comfortable. And I, get, I get it. I lost a lot of colonels in the Marine Corps who got to a certain level where they didn't want to move anymore. They didn't want to change things anymore. They had families in there. I need a very dynamic, diverse workforce that is willing to. Here's one of the things I get. I get, I get these thoughts every once in a while that might be valuable. Um, 
I get all these, uh, the civilians who talk to me about continuity, how important continuity is. And I love the idea of continuity to a point. Until you get the guys and gals who've known the Castro brothers for the last 50 years. <laughs> and they're so locked in. And they're lock I've got continuity on the Ca uh, Castro brothers that they cannot even imagine the United States and Cuba normalizing relationship. But they got the Castro brothers. And if we ever needed something on the Castro brothers, you could go to them. So continuity sort of, but if it creates blinders where folks can't see the world as it's changing, then I'm not quite sure how important that is. For me, continuity is organizational continuity. You know different parts of the organizations, and you just know the strengths of the different parts of the organization. So when we want you to come together to form a team, you know where to go, and you know how to leverage all of the strong parts of the organization. So that's part of the challenge that we got when we got one portion of the workforce that's been doing things in one place for 150 years, and I can't root them out and give them change their ideas and change their view and their perspective of the world. And another younger uh, part of the workforce is, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go. Send me to Afghanistan. I'll come home for two weeks and dust off, and then I'll go back and, oh, yeah, you want me to go to Tampa? I'll go to Tampa. Omaha, yeah, I'm on my way. And they want to learn all the aspects. They're very eager to see and explore different things. I'm sure at some point in 15 years, there'll be the old folks <laughs> who will have the mortgage and the teenagers, and they won't want to move. But if you have an organization, and, and, and one of the great challenges, we've got like a 5% turnover rate. Uh, you know, folks are excited because we only turn over 5%. Of the I need probably a more dynamic turnover rate than that to create new ideas and new opportunities, fresh blood. You probably need a nice 10, 5 percent turnover rate. You got 20 years to recapitalize the force. I don't know that that's really healthy. I, I don't know if I'll be able to change that either. Are you trying to pull us off the stage? Okay. I, I, I'm ignoring them. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, uh, Most of the folks are half asleep anyway, so. <laughs> Well, I'm going to wake them up with the yeah. next question. Yeah. Uh, contracting and acquisition. Uh, yeah. A lot of discussion about, about skills and, yeah. and levels and so forth. Uh, uh, do you have any plans to increase the size or capabilities of your uh, acquisition effort? So you asked me two different questions. I've got two because embedded it, in there. Because the difference between acquisition and procurement and contracting is pretty profound. Right. So uh, in terms of contracting and procurement, um, I don't know that we're going to grow our contract. Okay, we've got to be much more efficient. And the acquisition model is so fundamentally broken that it cannot be reformed. You need to just blow that thing up and start over. We, we, treat, we treat everything that we want to buy like it's got to go through milestone, A, B, 8, 7, but, and it takes us 15 years to deliver something that we need today because any acquisition professionals in the, in the house? I'm sorry, but we got to start over. If I could start over any one thing in my, the rest of my lifetime, it would be how we do acquisition in the modern era. To have, especially when you're dealing with cyber vulnerabilities, to understand your network and know what you need to improve the uh, safety of your network and you go through a contracting and procurement process that takes 18 months to deliver a solution is absolutely flat out insane. Guess what? Our adversaries just take their credit card and go down to Best Buys and buy a server. And, they, and we're going through this process that makes it. And oh, by the way, some of the folks, help. this is where you can help me. We have some incredible professionals who try to make sure it's fair and competitive in the decisions that we, uh, we make. Quit protesting everything. <laughs> You're just adding more time to this process when I want to get after solving problems. And every time we do a contract, the person who doesn't get it protests the damn thing. And nine months later, we resolve it. And I'm further and further behind. I've got great folks. They're going to give you fair opportunity. 
tell your lawyers to quit protesting stuff. They didn't want to hear that part. <laughs> I, I'm just asking. I the, can't tell you the, only the truth you want to hear. I'm, I got to tell I'm, you the truth that is. I'm just truth. asking the questions. I'm not yeah, grading no, the answers. Yeah. So, uh, budget and I don't fund. even know if I answered your question. You got me off on a tangent. We got to clean up the procurement and contracting. We got to streamline that because the challenges that we have are too time compressed. And the acquisition model is fundamentally broken. I, I every Secretary of Defense has come in and said, I want to reform the defense acquisition. And every Secretary of Defense has left going, I wish I had transformed defense acquisition. I think we, uh, we have one takeaway here, which is it's got your attention and focus. And, yeah. and sometimes that by itself is a, yeah. is a, is a process of I'm, I'm working everybody I can talk to on the Hill about changing the way we uh, acquire. Uh, systems to support our war fighters, and everybody who can help me change the way we do contracting and procurement. We gotta do that better. Sorry. As we look at FY16, uh, uncertainties are not only in the, in the world of, uh, of uh, Intel substance, but... Uh, I didn't realize he was filming that. I might not have said some of the things I but, said. But <laughs> Chuck also owns his film, so we're okay. Uh, what, what's the basis for your planning for FY16, given the uncertainties of, of, of the various uh, uh, financial factors? Uh, yeah. uh, how, how, are you going, how are you taking that on? Um, I, I've got a small group of folks who have uh, not only looked at the priorities that have been set by our national authorities, but just some, uh, some key analytic insights that says, here, here are the worst, uh, most dangerous countries. Here's the most dangerous actors, and that's how we're gonna align our, uh, our priorities is based on, you know, uh, General Dunford said Russia was uh, the most uh, significant threat. I gotta agree with him. He's future chairman, he's a Marine, so he's right. Uh, but we got some bad actors in the Pacific, so we gotta focus on those guys. Uh, we gotta think our way through, think about this. It, this is really kind of interesting to me. I, I watched this. When I, when I actually signed up to join the Marine Corps, in 1979, the Iranian Revolution uh, had just kicked off. And I was told that uh, sanctions was going to cause the Iranians' F-14s to fall from the sky because they weren't going to have parts and yeah. tools and maintenance and, and all the stuff to maintain their air force. And during the 35 or so years of sanction regime, they developed some pretty sophisticated weapons technology. So we gotta think about if, Rus if uh, the Iranians come out of a strict sanction regime and have money and can bring back the Iranian diaspora uh, with their uh, the things that they've learned in the West and they can buy and they can sell oil, uh, what, what role does Iran play in the region? a more positive and stabilizing role or something else? And uh, so we gotta think about that. Uh, we gotta think about the competition that's going on between Shia and Sunni that manifests itself in the, in the, the Saudi-Iran uh, uh, um, friction. Uh, what role does Turkey play in the region or wants to play in the region? What role does Egypt play? Um, are we doing all the things we can to help some of our partners in the region? I worry about Jordan, for instance. Jordan's got uh, more um, West Bankers and Syrians in Jordan than they actually have Jordanians. And here's a scary thought, at least it was for me, uh, or really how much the world has changed. Jordan today is closer in its thought process and closer in its relationship with Israel than it is with any of the Gulf states. I don't know if we would have said that 15, 20 years ago. I just had at my house uh, Egypt, Jordan, and Israel. And when I was talking to the Egyptians and Jordanians and said, uh, we're going to get together at the house, almost in unison, they said, Israel's gotta be there. And uh, we see more collaboration and partnership with those countries. Um, 
So those are the kind of things that are setting uh, uh, the, the priorities for us and where we're going to focus. We're going to do a uh, senior leader seminar down in Tampa at the end of uh, uh, August to take a look at what the Middle East might look like after the dust settles. The Sunni-Sunni internal conflict, the Sunni-Shia conflict, those uh, uh, major uh, regional aspirational powers, Turkey, Iran, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Uh, what happens if there's a Kurdistan? So we've got some folks thinking their way through that. And those are the sorts of things that are going to set our priorities and the way we look at the world. I think we're getting ready to get the hook. Well, one, one, ask one last question. Last one, all right. Yeah. Yes. Your three highest priorities for industry. Uh, as you uh, as you look to the future, yeah. what, what are your highest needs? Yeah, uh, data, big data analytic help, model and sim, uh, distributed learning and enterprise. If you can help me with those, you'll be very helpful to me. Great, thank you, sir. This is an event. Uh, this is an event. This was quite what a, what a discussion, what an evening. General the Smith Lodge. Yeah. Admiral Jacoby, thank you for moderating it. General Stewart, what an evening we've had. This, just this conversation alone. I don't think anyone wanted to end. I know you still have a few questions, yeah. Jake. It we, helps that I've been drinking, too. That's the best. <laughs> that means we've done it. But we did say we'd give everyone a general. This has been so great. We have a little something here from INSER. Your exceptional leadership and your selfless service to this country is truly appreciated. Thank you, sir. And and we're all here for you and for DIA, and I can tell you DIA is in good hands with General Stewart. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We wanted you, we wanted to get everyone out by 9.30. We thank you for joining us this evening. We thank our sponsors, our partners, and uh, what a great event. So drive carefully and have a great weekend.